Uh, hello, welcome. Uh, welcome everyone to our first public forum of the 2019-2020 academic year. Uh, my name is Ted McGlue, I'm the executive director of the UA Debate Series. Thank you all for coming. Give yourselves a round of applause for that. Uh, so this is the beginning of our second year of even being in existence. Uh, we had a really, really great year last year. Uh, we had uh, really packed crowds. I'm really happy to see that we have a pretty good crowd tonight. Uh, I'm hoping that we have a super enthusiastic crowd. We had a lot of pretty controversial topics last year. We talked about immigration. We talked about uh, prison reform. We talked about Title IX. Uh, weirdly enough, though, uh, this seems, based on the conversation that I've had leading up to this forum, to be like the most heated topic that we have run into, which is uh, great. So tonight we'll be de debating Greek life, as you all know. Um, what I want to make sure that everyone is aware of is that we're going to have a voting system, and the way that this voting system works, uh, our debaters tonight are going to uh, be, we're going to actually decide on who wins uh, by the end of the night. We're going to have a vote before the debate begins, before you hear anything from either of our, our two sides. And then we're going to take a vote afterwards. And whoever ends up changing the audience's mind the most, rather than who ends up getting the most votes, uh, will end up uh, being the winner. So in order to figure out how we can get that voting system working, Marnie's going to come up here and she's going to explain to you how the voting system works and how you can do it on your phone. Hey, <laughs> Hi, guys. I'm Marnie. So basically, we're going to use Kahoot this year to do votes. So if anybody has their phone or their computer or anything, pull it out and then just go to Kahoot.it. <laughs> and I'll wait until you do that. Kahoot.what? Huh? Kahoot.what? Kahoot.it. I-T. <laughs> yep. So when you guys get there, um, the code is on the board right here. But if you can't read it, I'll read it a couple times and then still just raise your hand if you can't read it. But it says 596-537. Is anyone having trouble? Oh, it disconnected. I do. Oh, Raj would read, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who's having trouble, we're going to make sure that we have ushers come around to... You can put your real name or... No one's going to see it, so you can kind of just put whatever you want to. <laughs> Is it the Wi-Fi? I don't know. Okay. Okay, I think everybody's is working now. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's five nine six five three seven. Okay, who hasn't logged on? Okay. Okay. Okay, so basically, I'm going to hit start, and how it's going to work is if you hit the triangle, it means you're affirmative or you're for the motion. If you hit the diamond, it means you're negative against the motion. And then if you hit the circle, it just means you're undecided for right now. And that's the motion right there behind Marty's head, so you can look at exactly how it's working. Yep. Greek life does not promote individuality, so if you are in favor of that resolution and you do agree that Greek life does not promote individuality, you can go ahead and click on the triangle. Which is affirmative. If you are against that resolution and you do think that Greek life does indeed promote individuality, Click on the diamond. And if you have no idea how you feel, but you're waiting to hear all of the arguments first, you can go ahead and click zero. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, they're going to run around and help anybody who still needs help. I just want to make a, a few more announcements before we get started. Uh, we have two more really big events coming up, home events at least, uh, coming up this semester. On October 19th, Santa Clara University is going to come here, and we will be debating whether or not religion obstructs human progress. Uh, that is going to be absolutely excellent. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter or on Facebook or on Instagram, or you can sign up for our email list if you want to get announcements for when and where uh, all of those things are going to be. We're also going to have the uh, first annual Regents Cup, where NAU and ASU are going to be coming down here to uh, uh, debate us for a weekend-long tournament where we will be deciding uh, about a series of resolutions that all have to do with free speech. Uh, so it would be great if you guys could all show up to that. Uh, but please make sure that you follow us at UA Debate Series on Twitter or on Instagram or on Facebook to get any future information that you might want. And I also want to make sure that you all know that you, as you came in, hopefully everyone got a ticket for our free raffle. Uh, we'll be giving out a free gift card at the end of the night. Uh, so make sure that you stick around to give us your second vote and find out who the winner is. Um, but that said, uh, I think it's time that we get started. So let me switch to behind the podium. And here we go. Okay, so again, uh, welcome to the UA Debate Series first uh, fall event for the 2019-2020 academic year. Uh, our resolution tonight is Greek life does not promote individuality. Uh, we have four absolutely excellently qualified debaters, two representatives from the UA Debate Series itself. We have Vincent Hasso and Taylor Vandenberg, who are going to be arguing the affirmative of, uh, affirmative of the resolution that Greek life does not promote individuality. Uh, on the negative side, uh, we have uh, Danny Kramer and Jesse Gates. So give everyone a round of applause. The way that the whole entire thing is going to work like this, uh, we are going to hear opening statements from one uh, person on each side of our debate. Each one of those opening statements will be six minutes long. If they don't keep to time, I have a gavel and I really like using it. Um, after we ha hear our six minute opening statements from both sides, then we're gonna have a cross-examination round where I'll ask questions of our debaters, they'll have a chance to address each other, and answer any audience questions that you guys might have. So please make sure that you have questions ready, uh, and make sure that they're challenging, and do make sure that they are questions rather than actual arguments, uh, and let the debaters argue against each other. And finally, we'll have six minute closing statements from each side, uh, after which we will take our final vote and decide again who's the winner based on who ends up changing the audience's mind the most. That said, let's get started with our opening round, starting with the affirmative side of the resolution, Greek life does not promote individuality. We have Taylor Vandenberg. Hello, thank you all for coming tonight. So what is the purpose of going to college? What is the mission statement of our university? One answer we might all reasonably agree on is autonomy. Autonomy is the freedom from external control or influence, in other words, independence. We can all agree that college provides us by allowing us to choose our own major, live on our own, find our personal identity, and create our own friend group. This personal freedom can be liberating, but it can also, as many of you know, be intimidating and scary. And the Greek system takes advantage of incoming freshmen and exploits exactly this kind of vulnerability. My opponents will try to convince you that Greek life offers many benefits like charity events, job opportunities, and leadership training. But these benefits do not promote individuality, they actually produce the opposite through group think. Groupthink is the idea of conformity and lack of individuality between members of a given group. This means that virtually everyone talks, walks, thinks, dresses, looks, and acts the same way. But let's not speak only in sweeping statements. Let's instead closely examine several of the system's least defensible assaults on individuality one by one. I want to start with toxic masculinity, as it is the most pervasive issue in Greek life and kind of the elephant in the room. In the early 20th century, when homophobia entered the mainstream, fraternities were actually believed to be dens for homosexuality. This fueled the overcompensation of heterosexuality that still exists today. Masculinity started being defined by sexual conquest and the lack of emotion. Let me be clear, in no way are we claiming that toxic masculinity is exclusive to fraternities. But specifically in a frat setting, these masculine expressions worsen mental health, increase the chances of illness, injury, and death. Students subjected to toxic masculinity are more likely to drink, become depressed, and commit sexual assault. These members tend to be emotionally isolated, afraid to show vulnerability and appear feminine. 
These deep rooted, this deep rooted masculinity directly affects the individuality of the students in fraternities. Members are essentially not allowed to express anything that isn't hypermasculine without being ridiculed. This idea of toxic masculinity creates an army of identical, over-sexualized men who need to assert their dominance in order to be accepted. We have talked about the hypermasculinity in fraternities, but how about the hyperfemininity in sororities? Image conformity is possibly the most normalized epidemic. Especially during rush week, members are required to dress in matching clothing and accessories. This idea of branding demands that rush students look skinny and traditionally feminine in order to be accepted. Members must dress and act in, a, in accordance with traditional gender roles and therefore have a specific feminine look. Seldom do we see sorority members who dress in, a, in androgynous clothing or who have pixie cuts. When sorority members have long hair, makeup, and feminine clothing, it is not incidental. It exists in the very values and thesis of Greek life. Image conformity threatens all creativity or individuality within Greek life, specifically in sororities. Still not convinced, how about we talk about classism? Which is also rooted in Greek life. Greek life promotes supposed benefits like professional connections, but this is just another way to reduce the independence of the members. When fraternities and sororities bring professionals to help members get interviews and jobs, it only ruins the independence of those students and doesn't teach them how to attain a job autonomously. This form of nepotism is unfair and exclusive. These students are essentially paying to be in a social club and receive benefits that marginalized students cannot afford. Greek life doles initiation skills and does not align with independence and therefore does not support individuality. Let's go even deeper down the rabbit hole, racism. Again, this racism is, this racism is not just a problem in Greek life and exists everywhere, but Greek life is an example of an organization that has been shaped by racist ideals. Statistically, white fraternity and sorority members have significantly fewer interracial friendships than unaffiliated white peers. In other words, Greek life is predominantly white and therefore allows significantly less opportunity for interracial relationships. When asked about the predominantly white population in Greek life, many members stated that it is not their fault, but mostly white kids rush anyways. There is a historical reason why, there, why this is. Historically, different races have not been accepted in sororities and fraternities, so the culture has been shaped by 95% white Greek life. When another race is accepted into a sorority or fraternity, they are expected to assimilate to the white culture that already exists. This idea of assimilation or exclusion in general it fuels the lack of individuality that Greek life provides. These members are being taught that they do not need to develop their own identity or individuality whatsoever because their personality, clothing style, jobs, and friends are being provided for them. If you think that this is a small issue that may not affect you, this is not the case. Greek life includes up to 80% of students, so therefore 80% of our university is actively engaging in these toxic ideas. But perhaps more importantly, 80% of our students do not have the basic sense of individuality in their lives. Are we really going to continue to support these organizations that do not revolve around identity, but rather sexist, racist, and classist ideals? It is important to note that our criticism of the Greek life is solely of the system and not of its members. We want to protect the individuality of the members from the systemic corruption of Greek life. That is why Vincent and I stand in strong opposition to the groupthink phenomenon, and that is why we stand in the affirmation of today's debate. We strongly urge you to vote for your individuality and not for the destructive system that Greek life uses against our identities. Thank you. It's right there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Taylor, um, and thank you for keeping uh, exactly the time. Uh, and opening up for the negative side of the resolution that Greek life does not promote individuality, our guest this evening, Danny Kramer. All right, hello everybody. First of all, thank you guys so much for coming out here tonight. My name is Danny Kramer and I'm a junior. I'm currently a member of the fraternity Phi Gamma Delta here at the U of A. Uh, and over here is Jessie Gates. Um, she's a sophomore who's currently a member in Alpha Chi Omega. The opposition claims that Greek life does not promote individuality and the headlines and rumors you've heard about Greek life seem to confirm their point. However, Greek life is frequently misunderstood by both the media and by the people who do not have firsthand experience in it. 
Many people from outside the Greek system think that the only reason people join Greek life is for the stereotypical reasons of drinking, partying, and interacting with members of the opposite gender. In reality, people largely join because they want to develop themselves as an individual and want a place on campus where they can truly be themselves. When I came to U of A, I didn't rush into the second semester of my freshman year. My first semester was still very fun here, but I felt like there was something missing. I was having a great time, but I didn't feel like I was really growing as an individual or meeting new people that I could really be myself around. With how big this campus is, it's difficult for many people, including myself at the time, to really establish themselves. There were many reasons why I, were, why I rushed, but far and away the biggest influence that drove me to rush was the opportunity that I sought to grow as an individual. The benefits I thought I would get from joining a fraternity not only met, but exceeded the expectations I had for it. Through my fraternity experience, I have gained many great friends whose intelligence, kindness, and personability has rubbed off on me, allowing me to greatly grow as a person. In my experience and the experience of many people I've known in different fraternities and sororities at different schools from across the nation, the groupthink mentality that the opposition believes that Greek life fosters is simply not there. Statistics from the Interfraternity Council, or IFC, show that 85% of the current CEOs of Fortune 500 companies were members of Greek life. 41 of the 51 la uh, latest justices in the Supreme Court were Greek life members, and around 75% of um, current members in Congress were members of Greek life at one point. Here at the U of A, the average GPA for a student in Greek life is a 3.23, a very impressive average for a group of over 5,000 students here at the university. So yes, your mentality is influenced by your brothers and sisters, but not in a negative groupthink type fashion. Your mentality is influenced by seeing successful people around you do successful things. Every day when I go into my fraternity house, I see brothers who have 4.0 GPAs, brothers who have gotten prestigious internships at places such as NASDAQ and Deloitte, brothers who have pilot's licenses, brothers who have served in the military, and graduate brothers who are multimillionaire entrepreneurs and respected lawyers. Seeing all these unique and successful brothers really inspires me and everybody else in the house to become the best individual that they can be and puts a positive form of peer pressure on you to carve out your own success. Individualism is defined as, quote, the habit or principle of being independent and self-reliant. For most fraternity members, their self-confidence and their ability to contribute in a positive and unique way to society greatly increases in their four years in college. So fraternities are such a bad place for individualism. How have there been so many successful fraternity members in diverse places throughout history? All the astronauts aboard Apollo 11, actress Betty White, golf legend Jack Nicholas, President Ronald Reagan, and Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg all rose to the top of their respective fields, and they were all members of Greek life in their college days. At Syracuse University in 2018, their student newspaper took a poll about fraternities and sororities on campus. Students in Greek life were asked if, quote, I feel comfortable with my fraternity and sorority. Over 80% of the respondents said they do, in fact, feel comfortable being themselves within their organization. This shows that the majority of those who have experienced Greek life don't feel as if they need to put in a front to fit in with their brothers or sisters. I can tell you from experience, when my fraternity or any other fraternity or sorority is voting on who the new members will be in their organization, one of the most important factors in giving out a bid is if the person's unique or if they stand out. Fraternities and sororities do not want boring people who are just going to do whatever the older people in the chapter tell them to do. Fraternities and sororities want uncommon people who can help grow the reputation of the organization through their unique skills, passions, and interests. In the Syracuse University survey, 80% of respondents in Greek life also said that, quote, my fraternity-sorority experience has helped me feel connected to the university. This connection to your school is an incredibly important thing to have during your college experience. Fraternities and sororities participate in many philanthropic projects on and off campus, have members involved in many clubs and activities across their respective universities, host numerous social events, and participate in campus-run intramural programs. This makes it very easy for Greek life members to feel as if they've established a personal connection with the campus. While as a non-Greek life member, it can be very easy to get lost just as one of tens of thousands of other students. This is where I want to point out that isolation and individualism are not the same thing. Isolation is the thing that Greek life does so well at preventing, bringing you closer to positive campus culture and building a person by making it easier for them to find unique and positive opportunities. On the other hand, though it's not a guarantee to happen, it can be easier for someone not in Greek life to accept stagnation, not strive, for their not strive to be their best, and give back anything positive to the campus, and thus not grow as an individual as much as they easily could have during their four years as an undergrad. 
To conclude my point, a lot of negative stereotypes about Greek life are perpetuated by people who do not really understand why people join the Greek system. The topic of this debate on whether Greek life promotes individuality, I, I believe to be the perfect topic to shine a positive light in Greek life. Because as I said, the reason for joining Greek life for most are not the stereotypical ones. It's all about making yourself feel closer to the campus and to your brothers and sisters, thus making you feel better about yourself as an individual. Thank you and enjoy the debate. Thank you, Danny. Um, okay, so let's get started with our second round. As I said before, what will happen here is I'm going to ask some questions of both sides based on the opening statements we just heard, and they'll get a chance to uh, address each other. And again, uh, they'll answer your questions in the second half of the second round, so make sure you have them ready if you hear anything uh, that sounds like it's intriguing to you. Um, so I want to uh, start by challenging, uh, something, uh, challenging the affirmative team with something that I heard on the negative side. Uh, so one thing that it sounds like these guys are pointing out is that a lot of what uh, a lot of what we hear negatively about Greek life has to do with uh, media conceptions and sort of misperceptions based on people who aren't necessarily part of those organizations, and they cite uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, presidents, Supreme Court justices, Fortune 500 company CEOs as examples of uh, people who are uh, are absolutely successful as a result of these things. Can you guys respond to to that? Is this just uh, a total media misperception? So I want to start with the media perception part of this question. These perceptions are based on statistics. We have time and time again seen that these are backed by actual statistics. We have in our, we have studies that show that the, the toxic masculinity does exist. We have, we have studies that show that racism does exist. These things are based on studies, and it's not a question of if personal, of, of if personal members do these things. It's the group. It's the it's the Greek life system. It's the actual system that promotes these things because it was built on these things. Historically, like historically, members like. Other races were not allowed in fraternities, and this has fueled the racist undertones. This is why this exists. It's not just media perception, it's based on real fact. So is the suggestion here, you're saying that it's statistics versus sort of uh, individual anomalies, basically. Okay. Um, did and um, I like, think that Vincent just wanted. like to answer the point in regards to like presidents or like CEOs, like these uh, individuals in like these higher places in which they were a part of Greek life. There was a study back in 2018 done by Miami University, and they found that Greek life doesn't normally tend to get you into these higher positions because a lot of Greek life members tend to come from wealthier backgrounds or in which their parents are highly educated. So it's not necessarily that they are, uh, like the Greek system itself is setting them up to be like successful CEOs. The, the quote on that study is, no evidence of a, Greek sal of a Greek salary premium. All right, let's get a response from you guys. Uh, well, I would, can, you, can everyone hear me? <laughs> right on. <laughs> Well, I would basically say that, yes, there 100% are some of those things you listed, they are problems in Greek life. But first of all, those are problems that right now, a lot of people are working on fixing. A lot of those problems are archaic problems that are far in the past of Greek life and are currently being flushed out. I can tell you, IFC here on campus runs so many different programs to help just kind of pound into the heads of Greek life members that that stuff's not okay. And I can see it working. People just, the attitudes around Greek life here seem to have really changed um, just among people in general. Do you have any statistics for that? I don't have statistics for it, but I can just tell you that here at U of A. So just personal experience? Yeah, personal experience. Like I said, there's nothing that I can, there's no been, there's been no studies at U of A Greek life specifically on what's going on. But I know a lot of people who are like leadership positions of fraternities, and I can tell you that there's four or five things. There's sexual assault stuff, hazing stuff, toxic masculinity stuff. I think Pike just had something yesterday, their own thing basically, which was to kind of tamp down toxic masculinity. So it's something that people are really putting an effort to just kind of get out of the old archaic ways. Uh, to go along with what Danny just said, so our uh, fraternity and sorority programs, uh, FSP at the University of Arizona is comprised of both students who are a part of Greek life as well as uh, alumni of the university and uh, of different Greek organizations as well as um, 
University of Arizona staff, uh, and they directly oversee all of the programs, events, and um, things that happen on this campus in regards to Greek life. Uh, and so any event that happens, uh, whether it is you know, a, a registered social event that a um, organization throws, or if it is some incident, it gets reported to this community, and they have direct say over uh, infractions as well as um, what happens, and so this is a, a, a higher up body that uh, controls what happens on this campus in regards to Greek life. It is not just a, uh, a group of current fraternity men who um, are deciding what does and does not go. Um, and going off of what uh, Danny said about these archaic principles that are we are trying to stray away from. Um, in 2016, the fraternity uh, Lambda, Lambda Phi Epsilon voted to retire the word colony, which means a newly founded chapter from their bylaws and their language. And they stated in uh, a press release that they put out from their nationals that, quote, um, colonization can connotate rape, enslavement, and genocide in nations populated by people of color. So we try and stray away from that to more progressive language. So it sounds like your opponents are suggesting that there are attempts being made to to correct uh, the criticisms that are that are um, that are being lobbed. So, and can, we can I have one more point too? Yeah, these problems of toxic masculinity and stuff like that aren't just specific Greek life problems. But these are problems that are all throughout society. So, so starting first with uh, just looking at like these student conduct boards or these boards that actually oversee Greek life. Back in 2010, there was actually a uh, court case that went through the Washington Court of Appeals. It was uh, Alpha Kappa Lambda fraternity versus Washington State University. And in that court ruling, it was found that these boards that actually oversee these fraternities and sororities do, don't act arbitrarily. They're not really cracking down on fraternities to begin with. Instead, they're just in a way covering a lot of the tracks because with these kinds of events that do come to light, whether it's hazing or uh, toxic masculinity, whatever it may be, it's kind of a bad rep on the university. So a lot of times these boards, when an incident does come up, they try hiding the issue and sweeping it under the rug like it didn't happen. So the suggestion that it's more uh, an issue of PR than it is about actual sort of desire to, to rectify these sort of uh, archaic? Yes. Also, I want to touch on the this happens everywhere else comment. That is kind of a defense, defensive mechanism because it doesn't matter if it's happening everywhere else. Everywhere else. If nothing else, it's worse. That's, we're not talking about everywhere else. We're talking about Greek life. We're talking about the problems that exist in Greek life. And it's probably worse that it happens everywhere else because Greek starts when kids are in college. They're normalizing it. And it's, I think that we can throw that out as a, as a, uh, Point. <laughs> I'm just saying it's not just Greek life that's doing it and normalizing because yeah yeah because just the way you guys were kind of saying it made it sound like that's just an exclusive Greek life yeah, thing and it's definitely as I said in my opening it's not exclusive to Greek life we just want to point out that specifically in Greek life it does exist well you go um, okay so Vincent responding to what you were saying about this court case and these boards uh, and the thought that it is just uh, swept under the table. Uh, using another example, like from our own campus, uh, last year the fraternity Sigma Alpha Epsilon, there was uh, a sexual assault incident and FSP, again fraternity sorority programs, and IFC, the Interfraternal Council on this campus, did vote to remove them from this campus for a period of at least five years. Uh, that was not sweeping the incident under the table. In fact, it was brought to the campus, it was brought to the university, and they made the decision to fully remove the organization from our campus and all of the members were, they're no longer a part of Greek life. Yeah. And I can say, just speaking on that point, just at U of A and, camp and I know that at campuses across the country, I can name so many different fraternities who have been removed by their, um, their respective FSP boards. And when you talk about that court case, um, what was like the end result of that court case? Well, they ruled that, but then what was the consequence of that? the university had gotten fined in regards to it. So and then they left the disciplinary action on the fraternity. 
in regards to the university hand. So that fine that the university got though, will not you say that that's kind of a warning to all universities to stop doing that and that could be considered a culture change where universities have stopped sweeping the rug? I mean, considering how many fraternities at just this campus alone have been kicked off since 2010, I think it's a fair point to say it very well could have worked. So I'm gonna get a quick response from these guys and then I wanna ask my second question over to, to these guys. Over here. Like you cite an individual example. What we have to look at in this whole entire debate is the whole entire Greek system, not looking at just the university of Arizona, but looking at all of Greek life. And just in terms of like these problems, we see that statistics wise, that frat fraternity members are three times more likely to do things such as commit sexual assault. We're not seeing these problems simply disappear in Greek life. Instead, they're swept under the rug a lot of times, and universities aren't exactly the most aggressive at cracking down on these issues as we've seen in the past. So let me just change gears and, and pose my second question over to uh, the, the, the negative side here. Um, so one thing that I want to make sure that, uh, as a moderator, I, I pull it back to the focus of the, of the resolution itself, because I don't want it to devolve into just sort of a pro-con Greek life. Uh, so let's talk about specifically individuality, and something that I heard from the affirmative side uh, in the opening statement was this idea of image conformity. Can we talk a little bit about uh, the concept of image conformity, the concept of uh, sort of dress codes, the concept of, uh, of, of, of sort of likenesses that we sometimes see within uh, groups of people who are part of fraternities and sororities? Yes, absolutely. So um, one thing that Taylor mentioned in her opening was the idea of during uh, like the formal fall recruitment how uh, sorority members are uh, forced to wear the same outfits and accessories. Um, the Panhellenic Council, uh, as a, the National Panhellenic Conference, sorry, um, does have a rule saying that uh, chapter members are not allowed, uh, no more than 30% of a chapter is allowed to wear the exact same item or else they get fined. Um, and that is to indeed promote individuality, to get people to um, wear their own things that express themselves. Uh, in addition, with this idea of uh, image conformity, uh, wearing the same thing, having a dress code, how is that any different than a workplace having a, a business casual or a business professional dress code? Uh, having an event or having a wedding that is a black tie optional. That having a dress code for an event does not diminish a person's individuality. Uh, it does not take away from who they are as a core person. It is no different than wearing your U of A shirt on Bear Down Fridays. You associating yourself with the University of Arizona does not diminish who you are as a person in any way. I want to point out a key idea that she said in her response. She said specific item. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this idea of image conformity in which you don't necessarily have to wear a special dress to all of your events, but you have to fit a certain standard of femininity. That's what Taylor brought up in her point and that this is an idea that is usually expressed among Greek life, whether it's a fraternity with hypermasculinity or sorority with uh, like femininity complexes. This is important to understand. A study b done by University of Missouri um, said that the women who participated in Rush reported higher concern with physical appearance than those who didn't. These women weren't even in the sorority yet. They were rushing and they already felt that that higher concern for physical appearance. They already felt the pressure to be feminine, to be this perfect um, ladylike concept that is pushed by, a, by sorority specifically in Rush Week. Your response? Uh, well, before I touch on that point, um, I think the kind of game day analogy is a pretty good one to why people are wear all wearing the same thing. It's nothing to do with trying to fit a certain image of masculinity or femininity, but just like when everyone's wearing Cardinal Navy during a football game, it's about just pride in your organization. Like, I can tell you every single person in Greek life is very proud of their fraternity or sorority. And they just all really, like, if I'm wearing my letters around campus, it's not because I'm trying to fit this ideal or whatever, just because I like, I like the thing that I'm doing. And I can guarantee you when girls are, whether they're wearing their letters they have backpacks, or even if they're all dressed up for um, rush stuff, it's just because they're proud of their organization and they want to show that. So, so the idea is that it's it's a matter of supporting something that you're part of that's an extension of your identity is, is, is exactly, the suggestion. Yeah. It's kind of supporting your identity in a way. Um, okay, so but can we hear a response to, uh, to, to the, the second point? I, I, I'd love to hear what, uh, what, what their opponents have said. What was that again, sorry? 
uh, your point before about the idea of image conformity being more about hyper femininity and masculinity rather than than uh, than, than clothing and dress codes. Yeah. So I want to point out once again that. Well, I want to hear their response to what you already said. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. About that. Um, if I can ask a question of my own, what do you mean specifically by, uh, in terms of image conformity to hypermasculinity and hyperfemininity? Like, could you give me an example? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that just the, the, like I said in my opening, how you seldom see um, women in sororities who have uh, pixie cuts or androgynous clothing, the, the idea that you need to um, dress up in a way of heels and dresses versus you can wear whatever business casual you want, pantsuits, um, whatever, but just the idea that you have to support the this idea of femininity do you want to take yeah and like i just want to point out that we're not talking like both responses so far from the negative team in regards to this image conformity has been focused on like specific clothing items such as wearing like a navy blue shirt or whatever it may be we're talking about fitting a certain image in idea. this debate like this idea of like this macho man individual or this super feminine uh, woman in which you have to kind of fit a certain criteria in order to look like your other fellow sorority members or fraternity brothers. So can you respond to the concept of gender norms, I think is yes. what they're talking about. So what would you say in response to how campus culture as a whole and uh, uh, social media and pop culture influences these gender norms. How much is it someone is dressing feminine because that is how their fellow sorority sisters look or they are dressing hyper feminine because that is what the campus culture is or that is what is being broadcasted on social media. How can you specifically attribute this to a sorority and not to what we are seeing when we're just walking down the mall? So I would say in response to the social media thing as uh I'll bring up in my speech, a major issue in Greek life is peer pressure. A lot of individuals do things or look a certain way because of peer pressure. So if you're in a sorority or fraternity and you see your fellow brothers or sisters looking a certain way, you're gonna kind of feel pressured, not exactly direct, but indirect pressure in order to fit that image standard. These are image standards that haven't just come up in the past 10 years. These are image standards that started many decades ago and we're starting to see that uh, become more prevalent especially with things such as social media, uh, we are able to see the kind of standards that uh, fraternity brothers or uh, sorority sisters tend to have with one another. I'm gonna give the last word to the negative team, then I'm gonna take uh, some questions from the audience, so have them prepared if you have any questions, please. But again, how is that any different than looking around your lecture hall and seeing how those people that you're interacting with every single day are dressing and wanting to conform to that? Um, okay, so uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Who has some questions for uh, for either of our, our two sides? Um, yes, please. You, I'm sorry. In the white, yeah. Um, you said that frats are more likely to promote sexual assault versus who, though? Um, Non-affiliated members. Yeah. Fraternity members are three times more likely to commit sexual assault than someone that isn't in a uh, fraternity. And then on the flip side of things, when looking at sororities, if you're in a sorority, you have a 74% increased risk at being raped. And then that risk jumps to 300% if you live in a, in a sorority house. You want to respond to that? that? Yes, absolutely. So we do know that uh, about 80 to 90 percent of sexual assault does go unreported. So how do we know specifically that uh, fraternity men are three times more likely to commit sexual assault when we're just basing this off of reported sexual assault when the vast majority of sexual assault goes unreported? If most sexual assault goes unreported anyways, then I think it's equal. If it's unaffiliated versus affiliated, they're both equally unreported, <laughs> then it's the same ratio. Uh, can we get yeah a second question? Um, when you guys keep referencing these statistics that sorry is that for the affirmative or the negative? Um, it's more for the <laughs> Okay, great, thank you. Um, you reference a lot that Greek life has been built and based on toxic masculinity and racism, but what statistics are you actually referencing? Because you just bring them up a lot, but we aren't hearing the actual evidence report. Yeah, so we have the sources if that's what you're looking for. So yeah. we we have a sources from the Atlantic University of Missouri, Columbia Research Journal of the Association of Fraternity Sorority Advisors. There's um, a Dartmouth study done last year in regards to it, in which Forbes it looked at Forbes Justice Department. It's we're, we're we're basing them all from real from real journals. 
Um, let me get, oh my gosh, whoa, I'm like overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm trying to avoid our actual interns. Um, in the corner, in the very back. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, for the Greek life friends, um, I have an example and uh, wanted to know your um, justification for it or your answer. Mm -hmm. I was in Greek life at U of A four years ago in a pan-Hellenic sorority, and during rush, uh, one of the girls in our chapter had ringlets, really, really curly hair. You could not straighten this hair for the life of you. Mm -hmm. But all of us had to have straight hair for Rush, and this was a lenient sorority. Um, and they made her straighten her hair every single day of Rush, and if it got curly or anything, they made her go over it again. So I'm wondering how you said that um, that the uniformity doesn't take away from your individual personality and your identity, and I'm wondering how when a girl walks into the house and sees 200 girls with straight hair, how she doesn't lose that identity or want to conform to it? Uh, absolutely. Very good question. Thank you. Um, uh, for that, I mean, anecdote for anecdote, having had just gone through the formal fall recruitment process as a recruiter, coming at uh, from this thing of how do we dress, how do we look, uh, for hair specifically, uh, it was make it look presentable. That was, uh, of course, just for my Greek organization, I do fully understand the idea that being a potential new member, walking into a house, seeing girls that look exactly the same can be incredibly daunting, and how do you feel as though you can fit into a place if you look different? However, I do think that people, women, who join these organizations do not join because they find the exact niche group where they look, talk, sound exactly like the other members. It's more based on the conversation that you have with them. It is based on the connections that you have with the people that you meet and finding the place where you really fit in, but I do understand how it can be incredibly daunting. Get a response from the front of the team. So I think because this debate is about individuality, addressing your concern, this is important because like I said, it's not necessarily direct peer pressure. It's that indirect peer pressure. You're going to feel pressured because you see, when you walk into your house, 200 other individuals that fit a certain image. You're gonna essentially stand out and kind of feel left out in the whole entire process. Oftentimes what we've seen is that individuals that don't necessarily fit the certain images that their fraternity or sorority promotes, they're often shunned out of the social circle, or they're, you, basically you either fit the mold of Greek life or you simply kind of just get out in a way. Yeah, so they're kind of making it seem like there's basic, everything in Greek life is just one entity here at U of A. I think there's about like 15 or so each of sororities and fraternities on this campus. You have a lot of different options and each fraternity and sorority has its own culture. There's probably a couple of fraternities uh, here on this campus where I would not fit in very well. There's probably some sororities where Jesse wouldn't fit in very well and that goes for every single person. But I genuinely believe that since each, um, each organization has its like kind of own culture. It has its own like things that make it special. Everyone can find a place that works for them. Do you want to respond before I get another question? Uh, just get well, a, yeah. Just another question. <laughs> which, which size is this for? Uh, it's, it's kind of both, but do you want me to choose one? Throw it up in there. Well, let's 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 throw it to our guests first, and then we can um, go back and forth. Okay, so <laughs> the affirmative question is: You brought up the study about the uh, Washington State and how they were fined and how they were sweeping incidents under the rug. Were those incidents the same magnitude as something like sexual assault? And after they were fined, what was the immediate effect of it? And the one for you would be: uh, You bring up how there was a sexual assault incident that. Um, Frat was kicked off, kicked off of campus. After that happened, was there some effect of that? Were, were other frats like? Did that create a fear that allowed the incident rate to go down, or did it stay the same? Did it increase? So, in responding to the Washington uh, incident, with that, it was sexual assault. We've seen just really all around the country a lot of sexual assault incidents, and the only time we really see like the university take like actual action in which like you have a fraternity kicked off of campus is primarily because something like really bad has to happen like like you the university essentially gets a lot of public backlash like i'm going to use swarthmore college as an example they kicked every single fraternity off their campus 
but only after that there were incidents for about a decade of things such as sexual assault rape or tunnels. rape tunnels, for example. There were internal fraternity documents that detailed these rape tunnels at Swarthmore College fraternities. And it wasn't only until that these progressed for a whole entire decade and the university got a lot of backlash through the public media did they finally kick these fraternities off of campus. Right, let's hear from the negative side. Um, okay, so, uh, Going to your point after uh, the fraternity was kicked <laughs> off of campus, uh, yeah, so FSP, uh, IFC, and Panhellenic uh, host uh, events once every few months uh, that are talks, lectures about like sexual assault, drinking, all these different things. They're called Greek speak, and they are mandatory for new members as well as active members to go to, I have been to several, um, and in which you have speakers who are educated on these topics that are coming and talking, uh, and so they are, yes. Uh, and then as, as far as uh, incidences of, uh, on this campus of fraternities and sexual assault, uh, that it has come to light. Um, I'm not well, sure, but mm -hmm. there hasn't been another fraternity kicked off campus because of that since, uh, mm -hmm. um, but all these incidents do get reported and directly to IFC and FSP and they're the ones that make the decision. And let me just really quickly add to that, there's also a thing called Greek Life EDU. It's about like a four or five hour long program that every single person who's pledging a fraternity must go through that addresses topics such as toxic masculinity, addresses topics such as <laughs> sexual assault to really try to prevent that from ever happening in the future. So in regard, in regards to that like Greek life EDU thing, mm -hmm. is there a test you have to take for it? Yes. Okay. And uh, do you have statistics that show that it, when you participate in that class, the, the sexual assault risk goes down or? There's, I'm pretty sure there's national statistics that do show that, that programs like that do have an actual effect on universities such as this one. Um, okay, let's take one more uh, question. I'm afraid that like Ashley's gonna decapitate me if I don't call on her. So go go ahead. Okay. Let's make it nice and nice and even-handed this question, and then we'll uh, move on to our closing statements. Um, my question is for the affirmative. Um, obviously, the negative can answer it as well. Um, I wanted to know if you're thinking about doing opinion on USFC Greek chapters, which are culture and identity-based chapters here on campus, who basically these chapters and many of sorority and fraternities came from the fact that they were excluded from society. Um, for example, 85 here on campus was a traditionally Jewish um, women's sorority, and that's because Jewish women were excluded from other school organizations. So if you guys want to talk about racism, and like excluding someone for their identity, um, what, what do you say about these Greek organizations? Yes, multicultural oh, yeah. So like in regards to these specialized fraternities and sororities, the reason why they came up is because as Taylor said that they're, they are initially excluded, right? And so like looking at the Greek system itself, a lot of times with these uh, like, most frats and sororities tend to be like predominantly white. That's. Uh, yeah, Taylor I, had I them in her them. speech, yeah. but also I did call ASUA the other day, and I got an official answer on like the multicultural fraternities or even academic fraternities, because I was actually interested uh, in regards to them. And the official response that I got was, academic fraternities are not considered to be a part of Greek life, as they are designated as honoraries. No, USFC is part of Greek life. Isn't that yeah, just yeah. isn't that just normalized no, segregation? Like Alpha Phi Alpha, uh, the, the divine, divine Nine fraternities. I know there are some Latino fraternities out there too. Yep. Mm -hmm. We have seven of the nine multicultural uh, sororities and fraternities on this campus. Yes, and they are called USFC, which stands for Unified uh, Sorority and Fraternity Council, which is different from IFC and Panhellenic, but they are Greek organizations on this campus. So the point of these groups are that they didn't feel it, they didn't feel accepted at, nor, at normal groups that so they had to make their own? Well, let's remember that the issue, <laughs> the issue of racism in this country is something that's not exclusive from, to fraternities. Unfortunately, yeah. Well, I know, I'm saying that again because the way you guys are kind of framing it is that this is just a fraternity problem. But yeah, well, the reason those Divine Nine fraternities were founded was due to the fact, I think they were founded, 
reason. When they were founded was in like the late 1800s, early 1900s, when really intense Jim Crow and just terrible racism was still really alive and well. And not saying it isn't today, but the scope it was in the 1900s was the reason those were founded initially. We believe that Greek life is an opportunity for people to find a place where they can better themselves in whatever facet they see fit. So having the having the Divine Nine, the multicultural sororities, having IFC and Panhellenic, these like social fraternities and sororities, uh, are all options are options that are open to everyone to find the place where they feel as though they would best benefit. It's not about finding the exact cookie, yeah. cookie cutter mold of who you are. But just to make sure that I get a clear answer from both sides, because I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't think that I'm hearing a totally, totally clear answer from either side. Just in terms of the actual way that these groups were formed, was this a case of, uh, of, of, of traditionally marginalized minorities feeling unwelcome in the most populated social fraternities and sororities and forming their own separate groups as a result, or was this a case of formulating their identity and making sure that they that they felt that way? The I'm, just, I'm just I don't know which I don't know which one's the answer. I said more succinct. The reason they were formed was not to do with anything directly in the Greek system, but just America at large and the societal problems that were really alive in America at that time in the early 20th century. Okay. Actually, when looking at historically the Greek system, it was founded upon the premise of white men. And even our Dartmouth 2018 study, they interviewed many members of Greek life. And when asked in regards to things such as diversity or these multicultural fraternities, students gave responses as, it's just the way it works out. It's just how Greek life came to be. And it's just the history. Um, I'm going to uh, wrap that up. Any, anything else that uh, either side wants to address, you can address it in your closing statements. Um, so that said, thank you very much for a spirited second round. Thank you guys for your questions. We're going to move on to round three. As I said, we're going to get closing statements, which are six minutes each. Afterwards, we'll take our final vote, find out who ended up winning. We'll also announce the winner of our raffle to find out who ended up uh, winning our gift certificate. Uh, but before we get to that, let's hear uh, our closing statement, uh, starting with the affirmative teen. Uh, six minutes uh, devoted to the affirmative side of this resolution, Greek life does not promote individuality. Uh, and to present that, resolution, uh, that, uh, uh, that closing speech for you, we have Vincent Hasso. Tonight has been characterized with this debate through two things, anecdotal evidence and facts and statistics. And I just urge you as the audience when casting your vote to look at the facts, look at the statistics, and don't look at specific examples, but instead the entire Greek system as a whole. And because the Greek system forces individuals to conform and assimilate into a specific culture, a specific identity, because of the system perpetuating these issues, Taylor and I are proud to stand in the affirmation of today's debate. To begin, we have to look at the destructive tactics that the Greek system uses to force individuals to conform to a specific identity. Specifically, we're looking at commonly used tactics such as hazing. It's no secret that college students take part in the consumption of drugs or alcohol. Although, the critical aspect to understand in today's debate is that the consumption of these substances are often forced upon those within the Greek system because of Greek culture. In a publication this summer from the Journal of the Association of Fraternity and Sorority Advisors, in a survey of nearly 100 fraternity chapters, it was found that 97% of students reported being drinkers and 83% met the criteria for heavy drinking. Moreover, evidence abounds that excessive alcohol use is higher among fraternity and sorority members than it is with their non-affiliated peers. The reason for this is that fraternity members have reported more social pressure to drink excessively in order to feel socially accepted. This pressure placed on members of Greek life is not propping up one's autonomy. Instead, members are giving into a culture of peer pressure in which if you individually choose not to drink, then you are shunned out of the social system. When looking at the Greek system, the major outlier is that those part of the system are statistically more likely to drink or be heavy drinkers than those outside of it. Although the problems don't just end with alcohol. 
In fact, a 2013 study concludes that fraternity members have been found to be three times as likely as non-members to commit sexual assault. Sorority members are 74% more likely to experience rape than other college women, and that number only spikes to 300% for sorority members who live in sorority houses. These dehumanizing acts destroys one's autonomy of their body. The Greek system is not promoting and strengthening autonomy, but it is instead causing permanent psychological harm because studies indicate that Greek culture as a whole includes group norms that encourage and perpetuate sexual coercion against women, which reinforces rape culture. The Greek system furthers this culture by having events that are themed as risky business or GI Joes and GI hoes. The cultural tradition of the Greek system is rooted at its very core, is to not promote autonomy, but to instead force individuals to conform to a specific lifestyle that causes psychological and physical harms. That is not strengthening autonomy. That is instead making someone a dependent on a system that forces you to adopt mannerisms that degrades the individuality of others. You either fit the mold of Greek life or you simply get out. These tactics are used to feel fraternities' hypermasculinity or sororities' femininity complexes. Studies have indicated that while sororities and fraternities do not have exclusionary clauses banning members of specific sexual orientations, most gay and lesbian chapter members conceal their sexual orientation from their peers out of fear of social repercussions. Sororities are still regarded as highly heteronormative in their selective offers of membership, as they have been shown to seek stereotypically feminine members. On the flip side, fraternities are notorious for promoting and encouraging a culture of, of hypermasculinity. The Journal of Studies on Alcohol and Drugs concluded in 2014 that men who adhere to traditional expressions of masculinity have comparatively worse mental and physical health. College students who follow this path are more likely to drink, become depressed, and commit sexual assault. These attitudes are forced onto members of Greek life, only, which only enforces a culture that lacks diversity. As the 2018 Dartmouth study finds that participation in a fraternity or sorority has been negative, negatively related to a student's openness to diversity and rates of interaction and friendship with someone of a different race. In particular, white fraternity and sorority members have significantly fewer interracial friendships than their unaffiliated white peers. It is not just one fraternity or sorority in which these issues are present, but it is instead the entire Greek system that is infected with a disease aimed at destroying the autonomy and individuality of all of its members. These members are forced to develop mannerisms and views that are cemented into the very foundations of the Greek system. The Greek system is not promoted on uh, promoting one's individuality, but is instead aimed at causing the self-destruction of individuality by forcing people to surrender themselves to a culture of peer pressure. These individuals are not independent from the system, but are instead engaged and contributors to a system that exacerbates the issues Taylor and I have brought forth for you tonight. And when looking and casting your final vote, just remember, we're talking about the entire system here. We're not talking about the University of Arizona. We're not talking about a single fraternity or sorority. We're instead talking about everyone, every single member within Greek life, that these attitudes and culture is forced upon them. And because of all these reasons, Taylor and I are proud to stand in the affirmation of today's debate. Thank you, Vincent. And to close out round three, uh, her side of the debate and the entire debate itself, uh, we have our guest, Jesse Gates. Quote, an individual's life belongs to him, and he has a right to live as he sees fit, to act on his own judgment, to keep and use the product of his effort, and pursue values of his choosing, end quote. This is how an article entitled The Objective Standard defines individualism. Being an individual is about thinking and acting for yourself, and not adhering to another person's idea of who you are. Through the course of this debate, my partner and I have held steadfastly to the motion that Greek life, against the motion that Greek life does not promote individualism. As members of Greek life ourselves, we have firsthand insight into the incredible ways that 
Greek organizations differ from one another and the ways that they promote the individual. My opponents have tried to convince you that all members of Greek organizations are the same, that members join solely yearning for a place where they can be told how to dress, what to say, and how to fit in. This is untrue. I interviewed several women in sororities about why they chose to join, and Amelia, a fellow member of Alpha Chi Omega, told me that she joined looking for, quote, a group of women to push me to better myself, improve my confidence, and be who I truly am, end quote. By focusing on small aspects of Greek life, such as dressing the same during formal recruitment week, we lose sight of the importance of Greek life to shape people into stronger, better versions of themselves. Uh, when Vincent talks about the excessive drinking culture in Greek organizations, I'd like to bring, bring up a report from the U.S. National Library that talks about the concept of socialization in regards to drinking on college campuses. It says that, quote, students, are um, students immersed in the college culture uh, and the college social environment in which alcohol use and misuse are accepted pre prevalent and normative will increase their own use in order to gain peer approval. So, so socializa socialization occurs without becoming a member of the Greek system, end quote. A culture of binge drinking is, not pre is prevalent on almost all large college campuses and is not specific to Greek life, nor peer pressure on Greek students from their brothers and sisters. Uh, additionally, the concepts of brotherhood, sisterhood, and family are not synonymous with conformity. While members do join Greek orga organizations looking for a brother or sisterhood, they are not looking for those who are exactly the same as them. These families in Greek organizations are meant to build people into strong leaders with strong connections with others. My own family in Alpha Chi Omega is comprised of political science, uh, law, business, and pre-med students, and we are all different with different uniques and, uh, unique passions. My family celebrates my accomplishments and the things that make me unique, and I feel no pressure to conform to their interests. Greek life was founded in 1776 on the basis of individuality and promoting oneself. To this day, every chapter offers amazing opportunities for its members, and each chapter is unique. Organizations differ in their values, pillars, and ritual. Each organization supports a different philanthropic cause, such as Alpha Chi Omega's domestic violence awareness or Pi Beta Phi's Read, Lead, Achieve. Members organize fundraising events and involve themselves in different ways. The events that Greek organizations have are opportunities for members to involve themselves in different aspects of the chapter. By having executive boards, chair positions, and committees, Greek members are encouraged to run for leadership positions that interest them. If Greek organizations did not promote individualism, there would be no leadership roles in chapters, nor would anyone be a part of different committees or different events. Between different chapters of the same organization, even, differing bylaws make each chapter unique from one another. By having a system of elected, elected officials, as well as governing bodies such as IFC, Panhellenic, and FSP, Greek chapters are not victims of groupthink. In fact, they are constructed of unique individuals adding their voices to a community. In fact, both Panhellenic and IFC bylaws encourage individualism. One facet of Greek life that the opposition was keen to focus in on was the recruitment process that fraternities and sororities go through. The belief is held, for sororities especially, that uh, dress, code by, dress code guidelines are intended to create a sense of conformity. Everyone should look and be exactly the same. As stated earlier, these guidelines are no different than a dress code for a social event or a workplace. Requiring an individual to wear a dress code is no different than a... Uh, <laughs> These guidelines are no different than a dress code for a social event or workplace. Requiring an individual to wear a dress code for certain days doesn't necessarily force a person to lose their individual judgment or sway them for their own values or morals. The recruitment process is about having a potential new member or PNM find a place where they feel like they can develop and prosper as an individual, not about finding the people who look exactly as you do. As the debate comes to a close, it is essential that you walk away keeping a few main points in mind. Greek life is full of diverse individuals and chapters encourage their members to support one another as a whole and strive on developing their members to prepare for the near future. Greek life does not discourage individualism because the different chapters and opportunities provided by FSP. There are specific chapters on this campus and nationally known for LGBTQ plus groups, religious groups, and ethnic groups. The recruitment process is designed to help students find a place where they believe they would best 
fit themselves and what is the best fit for their values and personality. It is not a place for molding PNMs into the same person. With all that in mind, I encourage you to vote against this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, we all have different opinions on dress codes. We can all agree that I look fantastic in this blazer. Okay, so that said, uh, let's go ahead and get to our final vote. Barney's gonna come up in here and just remind you exactly how the voting process works. Uh, then I'm gonna make a few announcements while you vote, and they're gonna tally it, uh, and then we will announce the winner. So Marnie, you wanna come up and remind everybody how the voting system works? Hey guys. Okay, so. Yay. <laughs> Um, is everyone still logged into the same Kahoot, or did a lot of people log off? That's okay. I'm just gonna make a new one real quick. Okay, log log back into that one. <laughs> so again, the code is five nine six five three seven. Five nine six five three seven. And then the symbols are the same again, so the triangle is affirmative, the diamond is negative, and the circle is undecided. Anybody need help? Uh, everyone vote if you need help. Just raise your hand. We'll make sure that we send an usher over to give you a hand. <laughs> if anybody came in late, uh, unless I'm too late saying this, try to refrain from voting if you came in late. We want to make sure we get an accurate count. Okay, all of the, uh, the votes are in. Uh, so they're gonna tally them really quickly. Uh, I'm just going to make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, just to remind everybody again, uh, we have a debate against Santa Clara University coming up on October 19th. Uh, that is almost exactly one month from now. And we have our uh, Regions Cup, which will involve our interns along with ASU and NAU in a weekend long tournament about free speech on November 16th. Uh, so please attend that and again, Follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook at UA Debate Series in order to get information about the location and times of all of those. Uh, and I want to make sure that uh, we get our raffle in. But to keep you in suspense, I do also just want to make sure that we have one last uh, round of applause and thank you to our guests for coming to visit us. <laughs> thank you to Jesse Gates and to Danny Kramer. Uh, and thank you to our interns, Vincent Hasso and to Taylor Vandenberg. Okay, so let me do the raffle for our $10 gift certificates, certificates to Starbucks, and then once I'm done with that, we will have the, the final tally. Yeah? Okay. There are two. Our first winner of the raffle is whoever has the ticket that says, I'm old. Um, <laughs> 865216. 865216. We have winner? Excellent. And our second one. Come by afterwards, we'll take a picture. It'll be great. Our second one is 865-266. 865-266. Thank you very much.
Okay. Uh, come on up afterwards to grab your two gift certificates to Starbucks. And that said, do we have our, our final tallies? I'm just going to do a dance for the next five seconds while they do this. Marnie, you want to announce it? Go for it, Marnie. You want to announce it? So the group that changed, the way that we do it, we do the mo one that changed the most. The one that the four before is 42% for affirmative, 11% for negative, and 45% for undecided. After is 67% for affirmative, 25% for negative, and 0 0.05 for undecided. Which makes our winners for affirmative, 25%. Congratulations to all four of our debaters. Thank you all for coming. Uh, come up and talk to us if you want any information of our events. Uh, thank you again to our guests, and thank you all. We'll see you soon.